I hope you're thinking of all the things that you're thankful for. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Lacey and Sierra for putting that together and drawing our minds to be thankful to the lover of our souls. I'd like to thank Pastor Skirbina for filling in for me this morning. And I'm sure if Pastor Borden was here, he'd thank me for uh, filling in for him. It's all about manners, isn't it? And we live in a time where uh, manners, we just don't show manners these days. And I I hate to uh, pull the old, back in my day, we showed manners. But, uh, you know, I was in the grocery store line the other day and checked out. And with, with uh, the, the total uh, of what the groceries came to, the whole staff should have been there thanking me for uh, visiting the store. But uh, the, the receipt came, and uh, the cashier handed me the receipt and just nothing. And I looked at her, I said, aren't you going to thank me? And she goes, it's at the bottom of your receipt, sir. That's... <laughs> That's the kind of society that uh, we live in. But we need to be showing gratefulness to one another and to the Lord. It all comes from Him. Uh, I would like to draw your attention today to a particular passage of Scripture that uh, I've been going over uh, quite a bit in the last year or so. And it is Psalm 96, and there's a certain verse we are going to land on and consider this morning. And in honor of the reading of God's Word, would you stand as we read Psalm 96? Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and all the peoples in his faithfulness. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we want to come to you with these things in mind. I pray, Father, that you would unleash the Spirit within us to praise you in the manner prescribed, that we would have an even greater sense, as we open your word, of your majesty, of your purity, of your holiness, all of your attributes, Lord, taking their place in our minds and spurring us on to an even greater sense of worship. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I've read this psalm many times, but there was one time when I couldn't get away from verse 9. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Now, having walked with the Lord for over 50 years, I've always wanted to come to a more and more uh, straight alignment with what God wants from me 
in worship. In my mind, I've always considered John chapter 4 as the base from which all aspects of worship proceed. And you're familiar with the story. Jesus is talking with the woman at the well. And he tells her, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So I became occupied that maybe verse 9 of Psalm 96 might be a third element. If it is so, then I need to know what worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness means. Worship the Lord in spirit, yes. Worship the Lord in truth, yes. Here's a mandate, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. I want to obey this, don't you? So what does it mean? We have a certain word in this uh, passage in, in verse 9 that can be translated several different ways. It's the Hebrew word hadara. And in my ESV, it is translated splendor. Let's take a look at some of the most reliable translations and see how it's rendered. Maybe we can get some leverage for figuring this out. King James, I'll worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. New King James, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And like I said, ESV, the splendor of holiness. The Hebrew names version, I'm not really familiar with, but it says, oh, worship the Lord in holy array. New American Standard says, oh, worship the Lord in holy attire. Attire, I, that gives my mind something to glom onto. I, I think we're getting somewhere. Now, we've looked at several different versions. Let's go even deeper and look at the Hebrew word. Now, I've got an app on my phone. It's called the, the Blue Letter Bible. I don't know if you use that. There's a lot of resources out there. But if I go to the Blue Letter Bible and I go to this passage and I click on the rendering of the, the Hebrew, the translation from Hebrew, we can see what it means like a real scholar would. Well, the Hebrew word hadara can be translated attire. Now, attire means not only something you're wearing, but attire means it's something special that you're wearing. So I think I've got it. Worship the Lord wearing something special. That's got to mean come to church, men in suit, coat, and tie, and women in your best dresses. So to wrap it all up, worship the Lord in spirit and truth, and in your Sunday going to meet and close, I'll see you at the banquet tonight. Now, we, we need to go a little deeper than that. Is this referring to something I wear for worship? Let's pump the brakes for a second. We've taken a look at different versions and how that word is rendered. And we've gone in and we've looked at what the Hebrew, the meaning is for that Hebrew word. What have we not considered? Louder? Context. And how many times has pastor said, the key to understanding the passage is context, context, context. Well, Psalm 96 is lifted from 1 Chronicles 16. And this is the, uh, the 1 Chronicles account of the Ark of the Covenant being returned from the Philistines who had custody of it for seven months. And it brought them nothing but trouble. They took the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in the temple of Dagon next to the statue of Dagon. The next morning they got up, they went into the temple and the statue of Dagon had fallen down. Now, also, their country started suffering plagues and 
all kinds of uh, trials, and they thought, we got to get rid of this thing. Now the ark is being brought to Jerusalem, and David wants things done right. He brought offerings. He blessed the people. He got his top musical Levites, led by Asaph and his brothers, ready to invoke, to thank, and praise the Lord with harps and lyres and cymbals and trumpets. And then in verse 7 of 1 Chronicles, it says, Then on that day, David first appointed that thanksgiving be sung to the Lord by Asaph and his brothers. What were they singing? Well, this is what they sang when God's glory and presence and holiness was coming back. And Psalm 96 has the meat of that song. Now, I don't know if you took a look at the construction of this passage, but it uses what's called a bicolon. Pastor Skirbin, is that how you say that word? Bicolon, bicolon, I, <laughs> bicolon. I, uh, I tried all kinds of uh, different pronunciations, and I guess it's bicolon. It's a literary device used in poetry where statements are used, the second referring back to the first. So these bicolons, they do stand alone, but one is dependent on the other. Uh, buy one, get one free. That would be an example of a bicolon. I think it would be good to read this passage again with the bicolon in mind to see the power that is produced in each pair. Uh, you can go ahead and remain seated, but let me, let me read through these, and you can follow along, and, and, and I hope that you will. Psalm 96, once again. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. And just a side note, do you think that David might have had the statue of Dagon in mind when he wrote that. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. And I hope that like me, now that you know that we've got these pairs that are dependent on one another, gives you a little bit clear of what's going on in this passage. Waited against the impact of these, in these one-two punches in this chapter, I can't rest thinking that verse 9 is referring merely to what I wear when I worship. Ties are expensive, but not even my best paisley would cause anyone to tremble. No, it's got to go deeper than that. Let's look at a couple more translations. New Living Translation. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Now, there's a little bit of ambiguity 
here because there is nothing in the grammar uh, in that first statement that actually puts the word his in there. But, uh, and I checked uh, with Pastor uh, Scorbino on this, that some of the ancient manuscripts, uh, for instance, the Septuagint, has the word his there. And it's good to know what ancient Jews and Christians were thinking when they were writing these things down. And, and thank you, Pastor Skirbina, for that insight. So, I think this rendering directs our gaze where it belongs, not on what I am wearing, but on the Lord Jehovah. Let me go a little bit deeper. Going back to the Hebrew word hadara, which we've seen translated attire or splendor or beauty or race, refers not to the item of holiness itself, but it to the fashion or the art of it. If David wanted to say, worship the Lord in holy garments, or referring to what we are supposed to wear, he could have used the word used in Exodus chapter 28, verse 2, where God tells Moses, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and beauty. The word for garment there is beghead. Not, not big head, but beghead. B-E-G-E-H-D is the way I have it spelled. So there is a word for what you are supposed to wear if that was what he meant and in the context. So he's referring to a picture that will produce a reflexive response of that second statement. All the earth tremble before him. The Genesius Hebrew Chaldee lexicon defines the word hetera as referring to ornamentation or adornment. Does anyone have their Christmas tree up yet? Yeah, I haven't taken it down since last Christmas. Just keep it up. How much thought do you put into decorating your Christmas tree? Well, first of all, it's got to be a Douglas fir. No, it's got to be a scotch pine. No, it's got to be a Fraser fir or a blue spruce. No, it's got to be silver aluminum with a color wheel on it. And does this matter? Yes, it does. It matters to you because in your mind, you have the perfect Christmas tree and you're looking for the perfect shape and perfect arrangement of the branches that will best conform to your ideal of what a Christmas tree ought to be. Do you have a color scheme for your decorations? Do you stick with the traditional red, green, gold, and silver? Or are you daring and select non-traditional colors? Carl Butler's mother, I own, worked for many years at Hobby Lobby. And one year in August, I knew what she was going through. She, uh, she worked at Hobby Lobby and all the Christmas decorations were coming in. And I said, uh, what, what colors are coming in? What's, what's gonna be popular this year? And she goes, blue and mustard yellow, and I can't stand it. No offense to those of you who are still decorating with blue and mustard yellow. But what about uh, garlands? Do you use fuzzy garlands, uh, garlands or ribbons or beads or tinsel? Back in the 60s, we used tinsel. And my sister Mary was trying to train uh, me and my brother John on how to put tinsel on a tree. You take each strand and you drape it over each branch. And John and I were going, woo, woo. That's how we applied the tinsel. But uh, these things matter to us. Are your ornaments a hodgepodge of ones you've collected over the years? Or is there a precious moments theme? Or a nativity theme? Uh, or a musical instrument theme? Or Kansas City Chiefs? Or I don't know, Harley Davidson? Or, or whatever you have out there. What about lights? Are they quick flashing or are they slow and steady? Are they big lights, little lights? Are they LED, incandescent? Or maybe you still put candles 
on your trees. Um, once that tree is all put together, it is arrayed, it is attired in all of its Christmas tree beauty and splendor. And where do you put that tree? You put it down in your unfinished basement back in a corner? No. You put it in the most obvious place that you can put it, in your big picture window. And you just love it when it gets dark early and you get out in your car. And I know you have done this. You have had your Christmas tree in your picture window and you get in you, your car, you pull out of your driveway, and you drive past and look at it just to see what people are seeing. My Christmas tree. I don't want to hide it because it is so wonderful. Every choice that you make is an artistic choice that says, hey world, this is my Christmas tree. And when you look at it, I expect you without even thinking about it, because you can't help yourself to say, wow, what a Christmas tree. God created us to make these declarations through the stimulation of our senses and our minds when our normal sensations are overpowered. How many things do you, without even thinking of it, respond to every day? Uh, do you remember when you first held your newborn child? Did you have to be prompted to say, oh, what a baby. This is the most beautiful baby in the world. You don't have to be told to do that. Diana and I had the privilege of caring for uh, her father earlier this year. And at mealtime, Diana would give her dad sweet tea. And he would pick up the cup, put it to his lips, and take a sip. And every time he would go, ah, oh, that's good. He didn't even think about what he was saying. He was just responding to how it hit him. A few years ago, our neighbor around the corner, their house caught on fire. And I could see the column of black smoke that was rushing out of every door and opening in their house, like a furnace up to the sky. And I remember just looking at it and saying, what do you do? There is no respite from this. And how do you approach something with this kind of power? Likewise, when we worship the Lord in the splendor or beauty or array or adornment of holiness, there is a reaction that we do not have to work up. We don't have to think about it because it will always be outside our expecta uh, expectations because of the nature of God's holiness. When we think of God's holiness, it's usually in the context of his ultimate purity, his total incompatibility with anything that is not of God. And yes, God's holiness is absolutely wrapped in moral purity. But he is separate in all of his attributes. His love, his grace, his power, his judgments, his wisdom, glory, kindness, his wrath, his creative powers. Everything about him is separate. That's why it is so important to consider and study the attributes of God. Taking the diamond of holiness and turning it to see each facet, how it is manifested in holiness. This holiness, this is holiness that causes the earth to tremble. God is serious about his holiness. It is awful, and it is awesome. It's awful in that he is unapproachable unless there is an intercessor and a sacrifice. Consider 
Numbers chapter 4. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, starting in uh, verse 2, Take a census of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi by their clans and their fathers' houses, from 30 years old up to 50 years old, all who can come on duty to do the work in the tent of meeting. This is the service of the sons of Kohath in the tent of meeting, the most holy things. Jump down to verse 15. And when Aaron and his sons had finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary as the camp sets out, after that the sons of Kohath shall come to carry these. But they must not touch the holy things lest they die. These are the things of the tent of meeting that the sons of Kohath are to carry. One of those things was the ark of the covenant. Now you might consider this passage as the OSHA or Occupational Safety and Health Administration instructions for how to handle the holy things of God. If the Levites had OSHA posters on their bulletin boards in, break, in their break rooms, there would have been a picture of Uzzah on how not to handle the holy things of God. You remember Uzzah, don't you? 2 Samuel chapter 6. Again, we have the uh, account of the Ark of the Covenant making its way back to Jerusalem. And it should have been transported according to God's rules of handling. It should have been on poles. It should have been carried on the sh uh, shoulders of Levites from the family of Korath. But no, they trifled with God's holiness. After it was returned from the Philistines, it was returned to Israel, and it stayed in the house of Abinadab for 20 years before it came to Jerusalem. And you wonder if the article that represented God's presence and holiness became commonplace. It may have been become just another thing to dust or a place for a landing place for magazines and newspapers and value pack ads. But in the manner that was most convenient, and when it was time to transport it, they loaded it on a cart pulled by oxen when the cart jiggled, Uzzah reflective, uh, reflexively treated it like any other load that would have been transported by an ox cart. And he paid the price. And certainly you remember Isaiah's encounter with God's holiness. His glory filling the temple where all he could think about was his own sinfulness and wondering why he was not being consumed in the presence of such an awfully holy God. So with the Levitical priestly sacrificial system in the Old Testament, God's judgment was kept at bay. But God's holiness is also awesome. It's easy for our minds to slot into thinking that there is a good cop, bad cop relationship between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. That, in the Father, that the Father's only desire is for judgment. And the Son's only desire is to provide mercy and grace. But if you don't know it already, salvation was in the mind of the Father. You know John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave. He? Who he? He who? Well, it's the one who has an only begotten son. That is God the Father. And let me tell you what else your father has done. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy 
and blameless before him. It gets better. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself, himself rather, as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glory, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making, uh, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. I'm grateful for this little insight into the conference room around the conference table of the Godhead on how this salvation thing was going to work out. Redeeming a people yet without any compromise of God's holiness. In Psalm 110 verse 1, it says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This is the Father talking to the Son. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, it says in verse 4, that you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. It's the Father's declaration that the Son shall be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 7, through 27, talks about the priesthood of Jesus. It contrasts the Levitical priesthood and sacrifices with the Melchizedekian priesthood and sacrifice. Verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number, but they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For indeed it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separate from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. This is awesome holiness, is it not? He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the people's, those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. The Levitical priest had a problem. First, they had to offer sacrifices for themselves, then for the people. And another problem they had was they would die and then they stayed dead with Jesus' priesthood, since he had no sin to have to offer sacrifices for, our priest could crawl up onto the altar and sacrifice himself and become the last sacrifice. And since he rose from the dead, he can intercede on our behalf forever. He is able to save to the uttermost it is finished. Have you ever had anyone tell you that, well, yeah, Jesus, but there are other ways uh, to get to heaven. There's other ways to approach the Father. Oh, really? Who is saving you to the uttermost? Who do you have that ever lives to intercede on your behalf? There is no one else. And because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, the curtain that kept us out of the Holy of Holies was torn in two. And now God does not say, do not enter. He says, come on in. Come in and enjoy the splendor of my holiness. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Another way perhaps to say it is 
I am overpowered by God's holiness. And isn't it a wonder that he invites us in up close? He doesn't sit there with arms crossed just bearing with us. He has given us his holiness. Did you, did you hear what we read in Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 10? I encourage you to go back and read that today. There, I counted 16 references to God the Father in that. Praise God for his holiness and how he has applied it to us through Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. And even now, after reading it and considering it, we cannot understand it because you in your holiness are separate. But you give us a glimpse into who you are. And I pray, Father, that it would be a reflex action of worship in every mind and heart that is here today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Considering the awful and awesomeness of God's holiness should remind us that we cannot enter his presence by showing him our naughty and nice list. You are not saved that way. And you don't abide in him that way. We like lists and numbers. You give me a list of rules to follow, and I can follow it. And I can measure myself to see if there's progress. Well, I had 37 temptations today. When I was able to resist 17 of them, I'm making progress. No, abandon that and enter in to God's presence and adore, uh, adore him for who he is.